No, I can imagine. I mean, you have to keep your eyes on the goal. Otherwise, you'll get lost if you if you be too fragile. I can imagine, especially yeah, in job. I could never you, pull you the girl hidden. card. Yeah. Never pull the girl card. No. Uh, like no. if you had cramps or if you uh, yeah. any of those. Nobody things. cares. Nobody cares. She just have to. That all yeah. that would do would put up a red flag. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> about uh you know see see that's that's why you can't have women in the studio that's kind of why yeah because yep. they, they have those issues there was yep. one engineer an older guy who was uh convinced that um uh if women were on their period and they spliced tape there would be a pop that we became magnetic <laughs> really we became magnetic if we were on our period oh, okay. so he didn't want women in the studio because because of that wow so okay. so that was our term from then on if we were yeah. you know yeah. on our yeah. periods as a, a, or you magnetic oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> need a t-shirt no i'm not magnetic. yeah yeah <laughs> or, <laughs> no i'm not uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Warning, I'm magnetic today. Yeah, go away, go away. <laughs> destroy our tape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just so crazy, you know, stuff oh, like that. I had another guy talk who would refer to women as the, the, the female race. The female race, okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> we'd laugh at that. I mean, we'd laugh behind his back about that. But, yeah. um, you know. <laughs> The female race, their brain's different. Their, you know, their lobes are further apart. They've proven this. And the female oh. race. And oh my gosh. It's like, okay, and move on. <laughs> yeah, and we go, uh-huh. All right. Oh wow. Okay. Oh yeah. Hey, and, and what what time did you because um a lot of those albums you were assistant engineer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened when you what, at what point did you switch from? Uh... Well, there was a very specific time, very specific event that occurred. Uh, I was working on um, an album for an artist named Jean-Luc Ponty, who is a jazz uh, electronic violinist, French oh. violinist, and it was a wonderful record. And I had been at the village for two and a half or so years um and i had uh you know learned a lot and the engineer on the project had um he was working on a few projects he was um much in demand and so his brain was on a lot of things so he was really happy that i could do um uh, some of the engineering some of the overdubs and all of that and uh he was uh, very pleased to have an assistant who had that much experience yeah. because he was really needing to put energy into other things and be on the phone and stuff so he was really glad that i could do this yeah. and um and then so we were doing a full tracking date with drums bass guitar piano some of the best you know a team session players and we'd been cutting tracks for a few days and um they had seen me in the studio like there was, had to be strange you know there were weird time signatures like five four or you know yeah nine four or something or oh wow and yeah. have to um you know, do, 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 do. you know, I could do these very strange punches. I could feel where they were supposed to go. Yeah. And, and um, so th they had witnessed me being efficient in the studio. Well, the last day, it was a Friday, um, you know, downbeats at 10 o'clock and all these heavy hitters, triple scale session guys are in there and no engineer, no engineer, no engineer, and and oh. finally calls in. He's been in a car crash. 
on the way there on the freeway and he's not hurt badly this was before cell phones you know so he couldn't yep. call right yep. away he had to yep. go find the phone but uh he wasn't going to be able to make it in and so they all just turned around and sean luke and everybody they looked at me and they said well you can do it you know sit down oh wow so yeah so that's Full that's what it happened <laughs> and so you can't it it doesn't happen like okay we're gonna you know you're gonna be a runner for this long and then uh and then after two months you know we're gonna move you up to here and then after no. the, it doesn't work like that no, at all so yeah, your your abilities dictate how soon you move up and and how you do things yeah. and um and uh you just need to be ready like if that opportunity had arisen if that thing had happened and i wasn't prepared you would lose your uh, career well yeah. i wouldn't have lost my career i would have lost a very valuable uh opportunity mm. because i hadn't prepared for for the unexpected yeah yeah and mm -hmm. so uh and i have to say when you're recording on that level um it's an acquired skill mm -hmm. i had worked with many different producers and engineers building my tool set yeah. and my own toolbox and learning from them and i wasn't just learning technical stuff the most important thing i think i was learning and this is really important for working in a studio or working with a band or working with an artist or, and mm -hmm. i i think it goes for live performance as well as in the studio is learning how to work with artists yeah and to work with those personalities and mm -hmm. be that team player and be a problem solver yeah um yet know the subtleties and nuances of uh, the creative process. Yeah. And I witnessed so many great producers getting performances out of people, just how they worked with them. And I would just soak it up like a sponge, but, ah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one record in particular that I worked on. There was this artist years ago um, named Debbie Boone, and she had this enormous hit song called You Light Up My Life, You Make Me Something, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, was, it was an enormous song that was played at every wedding that was okay. played. Everybody used this song just to the point of where you just you just yeah, could not can't bear hear <laughs> to hear this song anymore and i'm sure she couldn't stand performing it after a while but um so i heard that she was coming in well i was told that uh she was coming in to do vocals on a record and i would be assisting and i'm just going oh, i gotta work with debbie boone you know and you know one of those things and so anyway we go in and the uh, her producer was this incredible guy named brooks arthur who had produced a whole bunch of people and the situation was that she had one day to sing 10 vocals Okay. for her record because she was leaving at six in the morning for a six months jap uh europe six months tour starting in japan and oh so we were there at uh started downbeat was at noon and brooke sat myself down in the tech and there was one other person i think who was for her and he said I really need your help here. You have to support me on this. We have no wiggle room time-wise. She needs to be able to get all of these done 
it's going to be a long day and night and I need your support. So I'm going to have the light on me. The lights are going to be down. Please stay to the side so she can only see me. Mm-hmm. And he was very, uh, you know, he was a, being a team player and a coach saying, I need you to be able to do get us through this so he engaged yeah. us yeah. we weren't it wasn't like all right you guys just get out of here i'm gonna do this and it's it's us and you know and if you say anything you'll i'll have you fired you yeah. know there wasn't anything like that he totally engaged us and then she comes in total professional and she goes in and you know tape takes a little longer you know you have to roll it back and you have to listen and then you have to punch in or whatever so she had 10 vocals which is a lot yeah definitely to do in one time yeah and um so we were all there and supportive and i watched her be this professional and sing and I watched him work with her, pull this out. It was, it was like a dance wow. and we worked all night and he did a performance and she would rest in her chair while he listened back and she drank, you know, um, hot lemon tea with ginger or honey and, mm-hmm. and her, her husband would rub her feet or whatever. And, and uh, she was a total pro wow. and you know so often in the studio there was all of these cut-ups and all of this you know people you know doing lots of drugs or a lot of alcohol or both or you know um and uh there was none of that and total focus he got all the songs done we worked all night the limo came at 6 a.m and picked her up and took her to the airport wow and i had never written a fan letter in my life oh wow until then i wrote her a letter and telling her just how impressed i was and how much i learned being an assistant on her session and what a real pro really is and blah 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 and here going in, I thought, eh, I don't want to work with her. <laughs> and um, that I learned more about producing vocals that long, long day and night than probably on any other session I've ever worked on. Yeah. Wow. So that's so cool. You just never know uh, what you're going to learn and and so every single session is important yeah true true yeah it really is and in terms of of working with great producers mike chapman yes also (laughs) of course i can imagine he was he was really something um he's the first one to tell you he's crazy and difficult (laughs) and all that sort of stuff However, um, there's more to him than that. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of that he likes to, or liked, I don't, you know, I don't think he's like that now, but back then he was just full of vim and vinegar and, and was outrageous and uh, being his engineer was something, quite an experience. Yeah. However, how did you meet? What do I mean by that? How, how did you two meet? How, how did we, you, you know, yeah. what? that's really interesting. I can't remember how we met, except that I heard somebody, and I don't know who it was. I don't know how I found out that he was looking to have a female engineer. Mm. And I guess he had heard about me or had seen. Um, I was still at the village. Okay. Um, after the Jean Luc um, Ponty incident, um, I 
was put on other uh, sessions kind of as an engineer, but I couldn't be a full-time engineer or else they'd have to let me go because they didn't have in-house engineers. So I, it was getting time for me to, you know, move on. Move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and this opportunity arose and a lot of people said, don't do it, don't do it. He will ruin your reputation because he was <laughs> such a crazy guy. And uh, so I went to his office and met with him and he wanted, he was interested in creating the first woman producer. Oh, and wow. that cool. was intriguing to me. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, I want to do that. And, um, and he was very popular at the time. You know, he had a lot of hits with Blondie and The Knack and Susie Quattro and Mud and Sweet. And, you know, he'd written all of these songs, but they were pop songs. He and Nikki Chin, his writing partner, mm -hmm. I think it's mostly Mike. Well, I, you know, I can't say. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, they would write these pop songs and then sometimes put a band together and record just that or uh you know it wasn't it wasn't like the progressive rock like super tramp or steely dan or somewhere where they were this sort of artists on this certain kind of level these were pop songs and this was a whole, something different yeah a different way of doing things and um um my trajectory was it had the sophistication and you know sheen to it and and uh, quality to it let's say that yeah. wasn't necessarily um uh important on that level um as far as recording quality and things like that however uh the production uh, techniques that I learned from Mike and he learned a lot about engineering from me actually mm -hmm. and the bar kind of got raised um, for the quality of his recording but at first it was I was kind of like stunned I didn't know hadn't been around anybody like that yeah. and um, who is just so out there and uh, and that he was now my boss yeah and I kind of had to hang in there and change how I felt about things. And there you go. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was uh, he was always <laughs> doing crazy things, and and yeah, with his aviator glasses, and he was. He came on as the commander and would dress up like Patton and have the writing crop that he would hit on the <laughs> console. And oh, great. yeah, it was insane. There was a lot of insanity. And some of it, I just was going, I'm, I don't know if I can take this or not. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, I got to learn so much from him about producing, not just how to work with artists because sometimes you know we butted heads on how that went but um also the the business end of it mm -hmm. you know he was uh he was in charge of you know the budget and and um uh, the recording schedule and all these different things that before i had not had access to as being uh, just working with a producer in a studio that they booked. I'm now working with a producer who owns a production company and I'm working for him. Yeah. You know, uh, Chinny Chap and Dreamland Records, they formed their own record label. And so I was learning much more about the, the business end of things too, yeah. which was really important, but also yeah. how to, get performances and he um he had some drastic ways of doing things that i um uh, like uh i'd seen this 
sometimes with other people trying to get somebody mad to get a performance out of them and uh, being really rough on someone. Mm. And I still personally, um, that's not how I would get a performance out of someone. I would want to empower them. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's I would, yeah, I'd see him do that. And, and, mm -hmm. and like with Tanya Tucker one time, he was just really rough on her. And mm -hmm. she got so mad and she just sang the song and he went, perfect. That's, a, that's the attitude I needed. But sorry, yeah. I had to put you in that place, but we got what we wanted. Wow. And yeah. I just went, oh, I, it's, it's not nice to be in the room then. <laughs> I no, what, uh, no, and I, I've, I've, it was offensive, you know, to me. And, and I always wondered if, do we have to get to that place to get what we want, really? And, um, but I did learn how to work. Uh, he had a lot of female artists, and so I, learned how to record women who have much greater dynamics mm -hmm. um how to get that done we worked very quickly mm -hmm. so uh, fortunately i could keep up and um uh i learned a lot of really good techniques in how to capture performances quickly and how to inspire performances and it i remember he was working with this one artist and um he was being really rough on her and she just started sobbing and all that and he in and i was just infuriated and he said that's it i'm you know i'm gonna go play pinball or asteroids or you know mm -hmm. um do you do it and he slammed the door and um uh so i calmed her down and uh and i said w we can do this together and you've got it in you and whatever and we he said let me know when you're done and um and so we did and i did and she felt better and she did really well and he was very pleased and maybe he was just you know kind of being like that with me or something i don't know what it was but that that was a turning point for me too uh, as far as how I would choose to to work to work and produce and empower as opposed to degrade and um, and that has worked well for me and I've been brought in um, you know a few times where somebody else was being very rough with someone and they say we you know we can't work with this guy can you know He's can tearing you, our artists apart. Can you mm -hmm. can you work with her? Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and we definitely get what we wanted. But, wow. uh, you know, that, well, yeah. you, I'm, you gotta piss them off. You gotta make them mad. You gotta you gotta you know beat them down so you'll get that attitude you want. Like, oh, wow. mm -mm. oh, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. No, I can imagine. I I wouldn't want to work also that way. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. very unsettling i don't like a lot of drama i like a lot of positive stuff i like to dance if i'm not dancing when i'm hearing something then it's not quite it's right not <laughs> to the point yeah. where the artists say whatever studio we would choose to work at they'd say i need to be able to see lanice because if she's not dancing i have to make sure she's dancing oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. but then they know they're doing something right yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what when they know it works yeah because wow. i stand up a lot you know i stand up and i dance and i move and i'm moving around and i'm i like to work quickly i like to inspire and capture performances oh, wow. oh that's so, beautiful that's beautiful. yeah and for your album oh let me i also got this one. Oh, oh yay yep Love very proud it. of that record oh it's americana and, i also mm -hmm. have um i hope you can see it because it was because of the colors oh there it is yeah. yeah yeah and it's so it's so cool you got a emmy for this one right 
No, I got, uh, well, it was a platinum album. I was oh, platinum first, album, excuse first me. First woman to get a platinum album. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, okay. Emmys are for television. But oh, yeah, I, of course. Um, yeah. I'm very oh, proud well. of that record. And it was so much fun to do because every single song was a completely different style. If you listen to the record, yeah. you will hear anywhere from like... Um, a jazzy sort of song to a punk sort of song to a rock song to uh, there's one that sounds like a TV theme song. So go through it, sounds like a Western. Yeah. Uh, there's my first orchestra I did on that record. Oh, wow. Um, uh, a very Caribbean song, um, pop song. And um, yeah, I just, it was, so fun to be so creative with the different microphones and taking the different styles of the songs and creating a, a sound design yeah. to support that style. And you can hear the difference. Yeah. Um, on on all those songs. Song. Yeah. Yet there's continuity there because it's Debbie's voice through the yeah. whole thing. Wow. Um, but so many different arrangements and different styles and all of that. So the mastering was really important too, to yep. um, keep that signature sound. There would be a signature sound to the record. Yeah. Yet there's extreme diversity yeah. between the different songs and performances. So it was a great record to work on. And, and I was so looking forward to that record and, and I'm, and I learned a ton from Mike. For some reason, when he started working on Blondie on this record, mm -hmm. uh, he raised his bar too, or I saw a side of him I hadn't seen on some other albums he had worked on. Oh, wow. But that's yeah. so cool. We elevated each other, actually. Yes. Yeah, wow. we did. Uh, yeah. We supported each other a lot on that record. Um, I learned tons from him and and i think he he depended on me for my recording chops also the relationships i had with um um musicians that mm -hmm. who would be good for the different songs for him to contract yeah and, um because you brought in a lot of different musicians right for the for this record yeah yeah, yeah. and i yeah. was able to to be very instrumental in that. Mm -hmm. I've worked with them on, you know, on other records. Yeah. In the past, so. How long did you work on this album? Oh, God. Uh, I would say, wait, it's all kind of a blur. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say maybe three months. Oh, wow. Not that, not that long compared no, that, to the other ones. Exactly. Uh, yeah. We did all the basic tracks at uh, a studio called United Studios. Um, and then next door was Western recording. It was United Western back in those days. Now it's United and East West Studios. So okay. it was, we did all our overdubs and mixing in Studio 3, which is the Pet Sounds room. Yeah um at uh east west formerly known as western recorders yeah so um oh wow yeah very magical room i can imagine mm -hmm. <laughs> oh wow yeah. that's amazing and yeah. of course the the music industry also i mean it's if you make such long hours if you have to be on point all the time mm -hmm. I can imagine that at some certain point you have to take a break or yeah refresh or stop or yeah in, in um, your case it was different of course maybe you can tell us about that no it wasn't different at all it's exactly what happened i ended up um uh, we did so many records one after another for mm -hmm. he had eight artists on his label Dreamland, Mike did. And uh, so we 
popped those records out. And then there were some other records that um, as well from other labels. We did some work with Cher. We did some work, like I said, with Tanya Tucker. We did some, I'm trying to think who all, I mean, so many. Um, we worked up in Sausalito at the record plant up there for three albums yeah. right in a row. Um, then we came back down to LA and uh, we did we did strings for the Knack at um, Air Studios London. Which oh, wow. Nice. So I got to go oh. and work with the LA Filler, no, with the London Philharmonic strings. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That was great. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, it was just like, we cranked those out and uh, I ended up getting sick. I ended up getting stomach cancer. Oh, I was wow. diagnosed with stomach cancer um, six and a half albums into the Dreamland stuff. And we had eight albums to do with that. And then the Blondie record was coming after that. And I needed... I wanted that Blondie record, so I hung in there. Yeah. And uh, but the day after I mastered that with Steve Hall, um, I drove down to Mexico and checked into um, a cancer clinic there. And the doctor said, "Quit your job or die." Oh wow! So wow. I had to take a little cancer break, and I was ready. I was exhausted, uh, and yeah, so I got well. And yeah, fortunately, yeah. yeah, so happy, yeah. Yeah, and took a, um, yeah, an early retirement for a few years, and then um, uh, then came but back. That's extra tough, of course, because you had to quit your love. I mean, if you love what you do, mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard if you hear the bad news, of course, but extra hard if you have to quit. Which yeah, you, you. yeah. Well, um, you know what, though, I needed a break. Yeah. I needed a break. And so um, I was, was kind of relieved. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, so I took a break. And then um, uh, traveled around quite a bit courtesy of the relationship I was in at the time was I'm very grateful to this person because it allowed me to be able to get well and to yeah. you know afford all of that yeah. and uh and then that ended that relationship ended and um so i came back to work and uh i didn't feel like i could handle the stress of the music business mm -hmm. um because that's kind of what got me in the shape I was in before. So I didn't feel confident to do that yet. So I uh, went into post-production audio and, um, and actually that, that was quite, quite good for me. I could apply my skills and, yeah. and also my musical expertise, even though it was much more structured and, um, you know, doing sound design isn't quite as um, heartwarming as um, working with music, but uh, I was grateful that I could make Did a you, good living. Yeah. And um, yeah. so- Was it easy I, to get into audio post-production for you? Did, did people- I had to start like, at the bottom again, oh, yeah. after being this, you know, hit engineer. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, at, you know, I I was had this peak going and made this great record, and then boom, had to stop. Um, yeah, that kind of slammed on the brakes as far as um, my career went, but it, absolutely necessary. And um, uh, so, going into post production, which I hadn't done before, I had to start at the beginning and. I sat in on sessions that went all night to learn how to do shoot Foley, record Foley, which is um, sound effects, organic sound effects, and the sound design and all the things it took to what um, 
post-production audio was about. Yeah. And uh, my first job that I got, my hours were 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. Oh, wow. Really horrible hours. Oh, that's uh, But I had to start somewhere. And um, yeah. fortunately, it was a great gig. Um, one of my colleagues from and dear friends from the village, Carla Frederick had, she had gone on to work with um, Fleetwood Mac mm -hmm. and then quit working for them after a while. And her sister was, uh, wrote children's songs and children's music for TV shows and things. So she became her engineer and she brought me in to do that for a company called Left Coast. So actually, I take it back that, that she brought me in to do that. So I was kind of assisting her and getting my feet wet again, getting back into working. I hadn't worked for a long time and was kind yeah. of, you know, nice leery way. of what was going to happen if I did physically. Yeah. And uh, so that warmed me up. And then she ended up getting this job um, doing foreign music and effects tracks for the Disney cartoon catalog. And oh, I'm wow. not sure how she got that job. Yeah, but she, um, they needed a few people to do it. And so she brought me in on that, bless oh, her heart. Wow. And uh, that was the one that started at 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, but because there were three shifts, 1 a.m. to 9 a.m., 9 to 5, and 5 to 1. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of how Post was. It was more of a factory sort of thing mm. because they have air dates, yeah. you know, for TV yeah, and they have deadlines that are a little different than music. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot more people are involved in, in the process. So you have to stay on schedule or, you know, schedules do change. If something changes in up front, then that if, impacts the time frame of what you've got to do yeah um so it was uh it was difficult there for a while but um i learned a lot and um ended up working on more cartoons doing sound design and a lot of tv shows and films um or turner classic movies and uh disney and i got to work on the Muppet Show. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh -huh. that was great. That was really oh, yeah. a lot of lot of great shows and oh, um, wow. um, doing shooting Foley. Oh, or that's being so cool. a Foley artist as well. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And uh, and also mixing the shows. Yeah. Um, so that was that was fun. And then um, uh, was invited to this party that I almost didn't go to. And uh, a friend of mine from Disney, she had been producing Disney kid records and decided to become a mastering engineer named Nancy Matter. And um, so she opened up a mastering facility and was having, a, you know, an um, open house uh, opening party yeah to celebrate the opening and it was the sunday after thanksgiving which here is on a thursday and it's like kind of a weird day to have a party mm -hmm. and uh i had been with my kids and i'd had a rollerblading accident and totally screwed up my leg and i go oh i don't want to go to this <laughs> party but i bet oh you know it's nancy i should go and yeah yeah so i'm i go to the party and dragging my leg along and um <laughs> I walk in and, and, and I see this beautiful facility that she's built and has, you know, really accomplished a lot already. Wow. She'd been working elsewhere. And so she had some, achieved some, you know, platinum records and things. Oh, wow. and, um, and she had a partner who uh, was also successful. So they opened up this great place. So I'm back 
walking into the music business again, kind of. And um, so I walked in and, and immediately I ran into one of my um, supervisors from Disney when I was working on these Disney shows. Um, Buena Vista International, their foreign department. And uh, she goes, what are you doing here? Uh, this is music business. And I said, well, I used to be in the music business because post-production back then, you didn't tell anybody. You didn't say the M word. They, they did not want to know if you'd been in the music business. They had a, a lot of people had a real problem with that. In fact, I got screamed at one time by this person who potentially was going to hire me. And uh, he said, you may have been a big shot in the music business, but here you're nothing. Oh, <laughs> and I went, whoa. And, <laughs> yeah, and I went, oh, wow. wow, where'd that come from? But a lot of people have been burned in the music business and went in the post, but okay. they were, you couldn't say the M word. You could not bring up anything you'd done uh, in the music business. So was, you kept that way to yourself. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, so anyway, so I walked in and she goes, uh, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, used to be in the music business. She goes, can you read a score? And I yep. said, yes. Because <laughs> I'd been in orchestra as a kid and I knew how to read a score from, you know, re engineering. And um, she goes, can you be in Tel Aviv in three weeks? And I said, sure. Why? And uh, she said, well, I work for DreamWorks now and DreamWorks had just kind of started and I need somebody to be the foreign supervisor for musical supervisor to work with the, you know, supervisor there on this movie. Yeah. Um, for the foreign okay. voice. Right after Prince of Egypt. So oh, oh, first oh, wow. big movies. So this was the Road to El Dorado um, that they were doing, and Elton John had written all the songs for it, and they have to be dubbed in all these different languages because um, not just the music, but the um, the dialogue because kids can't read subtitles. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So um, so I was sent there to. Oh, so I got that job that night and then I walked around a little more and ran into a friend of mine who had just uh, become president and opened up a new studio called Royal Tone and she uh, said, well, are you doing music these days? And I said, um, well, sure. <laughs> and she said, because I have this new studio and I'd like to give you studio time to, to try out the room. And I went, great and okay. it was so high end cool. studio. so I went well this is good and then a little while later this band comes up to me these young guys and they go are you Lenny's band and I went yeah I am <laughs> and I said oh, whoa uh, well we're you know we love Blondie and the stuff that you've done and and we have this band and and um we have a budget and we'd love it if you'd do some demos with us um we can pay you and uh, oh. and i said well i've got studio time <laughs> so all of that happened and one for going to a party i almost didn't go to it oh wow that's the and, most productive party ever <laughs> yes so whenever i get invited to something and i'm going oh i'm too tired oh i don't want to lose i I you think about a party yourself. and I get myself <laughs> up and I get there. And oh, wow. if I just meet one new person or something always positive happens. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and, how awesome this is. Uh, yeah. And then, wow. then I had a, you know, I worked from 1999 to 2004 or five with, for DreamWorks as a foreign dubbing supervisor. Wow. So I got sent all over the place. Oh, and wow. uh, yeah, 
So that was a great gift. That was one of my favorite jobs I've ever had, overseeing the foreign recordings of yeah. um, Shrek and, and Spirit. And oh, wow. um, yeah, these animated features, Shrek 2. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, those are so fun to work on. They, yes, yeah. yes. And yeah. you go, you know, I did, I was in Rio for a month for Shrek. And then I was in Scandinavia for, oh, I did three, four different languages. I did yeah. Dutch and Flemish in oh, Amsterdam yeah. for Spirit. And then um, I was in Oslo and, yeah. uh, and then um, Stockholm, but mostly Karl Skoga, this little tiny mm -hmm. town in Sweden. So I was gone for, you know, a few months. Uh, yeah. Yeah. because of that and that was pretty wonderful oh wow How yeah awesome. oh, that, that's so fun yeah so these were all different things and and the the thing was i um the last movie i worked on was shrek 2 and uh i was in greece i was in athens i did mm -hmm. the greek version and the um turkish version so i was working in istanbul and mm -hmm. uh uh, so I was actually uh, producing the Turkish versions of the songs for, for Shrek 2. Yeah. And uh, they sent in this um, opera singer. You know, they wanted star talent in every one of the territories. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it'd sell the record or sell the film. And uh, so they, to sing this um, rock song, I'm holding out for a hero is yeah. in um, Shrek 2 and they send in this this opera singer and she's young but she's very structured and very stiff yeah. and um, the way she sang it in Turkish was just not really swinging at yeah. all and I went oh boy we got we, I gotta figure this out so um, so I said to her through in interpreter she was really neat and she could speak some english but not very much and i said to her did you ever when you were like 13 or when you were a teenager did you ever go in the bathroom and take your hairbrush and hold it like a microphone and rock out and sing to your favorite madonna song or yeah. you know, whatever. And uh, any one of these, I forget who I was saying. And she went, yeah, yeah, I did. And I said, did you ever want to be a rock star? She goes, I did. And I said, well, now's your chance. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> and she went, wow. So, um, so she went out there and I stayed in the control room and I just, you know, cheered her on and and gave her the dynamics and she was just, she just exploded. She oh, wow. sang it like she'd never sung before. And oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and it was so exciting to see her come alive on this level and sing, sing a, like, I mean, she just really did a number on it. Man, it was fantastic. And, the next day she came back to the studio and she brought me these presents and, and things oh, and just thanked cool. me like crazy for, uh, you know, awakening her. It was yeah. almost like, you know, yeah, but because all, for her. Because all your experience with the music, with working with all these kind of artists, with working with all these mm -hmm. different producers. Yes. That's the extra that you could give to her yes. experience. Yeah. Well, you just I can um, imagine. Yeah. yeah. You pull on your experience or you you pull on, okay, how would so and so have been this? Or or yeah. how, what do we do here? What do we need here? Yeah. And exactly. what do we need for her to be able to do this? And yeah. uh and so that's what I came up with and it worked. Oh, wow. Um but that's that's you know I learned that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it was your experience that brought mm -hmm. you, um, you, you could give her the extra. Didn't that um, also trigger um, maybe the miss for music or, or, or recording artists again? Well, that's 
exactly what happened, uh, yeah. especially <laughs> on that one. I was having so much fun producing vocals, yeah. even though they weren't in my own language. I was doing it. That was, I mean, I was just having a blast and I missed, I, I missed making records so badly. Suddenly it, it came back and I went, I need to do this again. I mean, this was my first love making records. If, if I don't get on this soon, it's not going to happen, you know, yeah. and yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back and make records. So I came home and I just kind of said to the universe, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I need to do this again and um, mm -hmm. I'll figure it out. And mm -hmm. uh, amazingly enough, the day uh, after I said, I want to make records again, I got a phone call the very next day from me. An artist I had worked with, a female blues artist named Janova Magnus, great, great singer, songwriter, powerhouse. Mm -hmm. um, she called and said, you know, I'm supposed to, uh, she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, nothing. I just got back from, <laughs> you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And she goes, do you want to produce a record? And I went, uh, I yeah, do. she goes, uh, I'm supposed to do this record. I'm supposed to produce this artist. And I'm this project came up for me and I'm not going to be able to do it. And I was wondering if you'd want to do it. And I said, sure. And got wow. right back into it, engineered and produced it. And uh, that got me going, working with real musicians, playing real instruments and, you know, oh, old school wow. style. And we didn't go to tape on that one. No. Um, but I, I record the Pro Tools as if I'm recording the tape, um, yeah. pretty much. So it's fast and efficient and I keep the energy going. Yeah. You know, um, I don't do a gazillion takes of anything or, and you I prefer musicians yeah. to work together. And um, yeah. then we can do overdose, but I like to work fast so the energy is still high. Yeah. And uh, um, but so so that started on that um, process. And then one record leads to another one. You know, the industry has changed completely. So I I do um, all sorts of things um, yeah. with audio. Thankfully, I have a, a lot of skills that I can apply that allow me to afford to be able to stay in the music business yeah. and um today in fact i will be um well one of the things i do i'll, I'll just turn this here you can see that i have a reel to reel tape machine here oh cool um, yeah that i um digitize uh old tapes for people and yeah. um and then today i will be taking on some vinyl that uh well, yeah has, uh, it's not available in any other format and um, uh, digitizing that for someone so they can work with it and do other things with it. And uh, yeah. so I do those sort of things and I just engineered and produced, well, I don't have the record right by me, but I do have a sticker here for this wonderful record I'm very proud of. Oh yeah. Primal Kings. Primal it's, uh, Kings. Primal Kings, yes, go to the website and, and you can hear it. And the vinyl is actually available for sale now, oh, wow. but um, it was recorded to two inch tape, mixed to half inch tape, and the uh, vinyl was cut from the half inch tape. So the actual vinyl is AAA legacy quality. Oh, wow. Um, no, no digital, no D word um, uh, analog. Wow. Yeah, and yeah. it sounds like it. It's just as wonderful because, you know, in digital, for every on, there's an off. For every yeah. one, there's a zero. Yeah. So that just says to me that half the information isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
even if you have a higher sample rate and it sounds like more stuff's there, but it's not all there where analog is all there. So there, you know, there are issues both ways, but um, for certain kinds of music, um, especially working with a rock band, Primal Kings is like a blues roots, roots rock. Boy, did we have fun making that record. <laughs> and uh, the guys were, were great and great musicians. And the singer is like a, a one shot um, right. wonder. You know, he, he's a real singer, great wow. singer and great guy and great lyricist. There's, you know, strong song. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, very, very proud of this. I and can that's, yeah. And at this point in my career, there's there are three things that uh, I like to have when I work with people when they want me to work on their record. Um, they do have to. If somebody says they're a singer, they really need to be a singer. Mm -hmm. I don't like to melodyne or auto tune. No, no. If I, they need to be able yeah. to sing. Yeah. yeah, they get to re-sing it, that yeah. line or that word or something. Unless it's one little thing that I find later, but typically, you know, I'll work with a real singer and musicians who, um, who know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, if they're session players, they, they need to be able to read mm -hmm. and uh, read charts and things. But the, the most important thing is, or just as important is they need to be kind. Exactly. You need to have a good atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I work with nice people. Yeah. I don't have to work with people who aren't nice anymore. Yeah. <laughs> was but, almost going to say a word, but I, I swallowed it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I have been censoring myself through this entire <laughs> interview. My, my mommy would be proud. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, uh, that's really important to me uh, because it's such a wonderful creative experience. And yet, there's there's enough there are enough issues going on with making a record that that's yeah. going to bring up enough stress anyway. If you don't get along with the people or you don't like the music, um, it's it's hell on earth. And yeah. and uh, it's really important that any band has somebody engineering producing them that likes their project they mm -hmm. deserve that if exactly I, if somebody yeah. comes to me with a project that and i play their music and it doesn't speak to me um i'll i'll tell them you know i don't think i'm the right person for your record but the you know keep looking and i'm i'm sure there is because uh just because i don't relate to it doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to there's exactly. probably somebody out there is just like, whoa this is i can't wait to work on it that's yeah. who should be working on that record exactly but um, then you also get a, you give a positive feedback and people will respect you for it well it's yeah it's genuine and, yeah, they, and exactly. there has to be trust they have to know like for when I first heard Primal King, so that was another situation that I almost didn't go hear them play. Mm -hmm. uh, the guitar player was a good friend of mine and been in other bands. And he said, well, I've got this band and we're playing tonight. And I went, oh, shoot, I never go here and play. I better go and see her as a little band. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I go and I'm just blown away and wow. uh, just loved them, loved yeah. the music. and met him afterwards and said boy you know if you ever want to make a record let me know i would love to do a record with you wow. and then yeah. they went sure okay well, you know that wow that'd be great and so there was a big love fest from the beginning and then i didn't hear anything for about a year and then the lead singer was watching this movie sound city and there's a, a you know dave Grohl and you know about the studio yep. and all of that mm -hmm. and there's a scene where uh, they're recording to tape and the engineer turns to the camera and says, this is how real men make records. And he said it just like leaped out at him. Um, and he called up the guitar player and he said, we call Lanise, we, we're going to make a record. Yeah. And that's oh, how that happened. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, 
two things happen when I agree to make a record with a band or an artist. Or, um, one is um, I become the, the newest member of the band mm -hmm. as the engineer producer because I'm playing the, the console and I'm mm -hmm. playing the, um, you know, I'm producing, I'm playing the monitors, I'm playing the microphones, I'm doing all of that stuff. And yeah. then the other thing I become is their biggest fan. Yeah, yeah. And so when I have an idea or have a um, suggestion for a part or something like that, um, that band knows that um, it's because I care and because I really like that they they trust me. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you try something and it doesn't work out. And mm -hmm. That's fine, but. Um, they're, they're willing to do it. Are willing, knowing that uh, I have their complete interest, our complete interest at, at, at heart, and uh, um, much the more willing to work together. And because they know I'm, I really care, and I really love the music and and them. So, yeah, yeah. those well, are two very important things that have a huge impact on the. Um, quality of the recording and you can hear good vibes and bad vibes on recordings and uh, you know you can just feel them and on our record while well, you can just feel the joy and we just it was a blast wow wow can't wait to hear it I need to hear it <laughs> yeah well the, like I said the vinyl's available um, but you can also hear the digital downloads and we had it mastered digitally of course by uh, um, the vinyl was did, was mastered by Ron McMaster over at Capitol, and okay. just he just did a tremendous job as he would. He's yeah. just iconic, and um, and then Warren Sokol uh, did the digital masters, and I'm we're just as pleased with those. Wow, um, both of them are just really, really good. So. I'm, yeah. Because mastering can also, I um, you need a good master. Uh, oh gosh, yes. It's it's such an important. Oh, finishing it, touch. There are three elements to recording. There's um, recording, mixing, and mastering. All mm -hmm. three are equally important. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people will spend a lot of time and energy and record it really well and mix it really well, and then they'll not master it well and it's i'm it's a shame I, yeah. yeah i would never uh attempt to master my own music that i've been working on because i'm too close to it i yeah. want to take it to somebody that all they do all day yeah. is make hit records yeah because they know what that sounds like yeah exactly and yes i can bring a reference to them and all of that and we work together but basically that person knows what this is supposed what to sound like. Yeah, and that's exactly. why I, I hire them. Yeah. And uh, Gavin Lurson is another one I, I use a lot too over at Lurson Mastering. Oh, yeah. They're very good too. There's a lot of great mastering after out there. Piper Payne, fantastic yeah. mastering engineer. Mm -hmm. um, so many. Um, yeah. And just like engineers, you know, people have their different setups, their um, different approaches, you know, it's their signature, it's their fingerprint. And uh, so you go with what resonates with you and, and if they're good at what they do, you're gonna have a good product, yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know, and if you've worked with them before or you know more, you know, their styles, is, you, you know, you get used to working with certain people, but I, I try different people too, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's so important that the record's mastered correctly. Yeah, definitely. Do you sit on, in on a, a mastering session? Oh, uh, I do. And they're not always, you know, uh, that, that costs more mm -hmm. um, because uh, if they can master when they can, you know, I, uh, on independent projects, you don't always have quite the budget that one has on a big project. 
And then a lot of people don't want to go to mass here. But personally for me, um, it's, it's a really important part of my experience yeah. when I'm making a record because I, it takes it from being uh, mixes and you know the, that third phase, I hear it all just come together. Yeah. And for me to be in that room while that is happening, it's like closure for me yeah and um and i'm not a, a troublemaker i keep my mouth shut i listen and i you know let them do their job it's just important for me to be there and so it's a linear process instead of them doing part of it now and part of it later you know whenever they can fit it in and so um they charge more for that but mm -hmm. um but it's worth it, probably. Well, that that kind of has to be a part of it for me. It's yeah. part of the experience that I need to have. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, I have a few more questions. If if sure. I mean, we're we're. Oh my gosh, we're already talking. Over I know hour, we've been going I mean, a long it's time. So interesting. It's so interesting. Um. Uh, well, you have you have been interviewed a lot, of course, over the years. You've done a lot of. Uh, wonderful interviews were there you, at you. any times um and, and maybe even now do you feel like there were questions that were missed which you would actually love to be asked or what you would love oh, to oh. tell about or um that's a good question I, that's a question i've never been asked before very good <laughs> it has mm -hmm. to be has to be the first. Um, <laughs> it isn't even my question. It's one of the other sound girls, so it's not my credit. But I love the question, so I. I love the question too. Shoot. Well, you know what? Um, the one that I was asked, and uh, and I already provided the the answer to, uh, was about. I guess it wouldn't be a question, but something I haven't included in an interview before is about the school and education and the type of person you are and and what is important to you and, and always doing things the structured way or the expected way um, doesn't necessarily have to be the way one does things and doesn't mean that you're not good at what you do. Yeah. Or what you want to do, um, that just persevere and be authentic to yourself. Yeah. And uh, but you don't have to, you don't have to be a particularly good high school student. No, no, it doesn't need <laughs> that to to get you where you want to go. No. Yeah. No. Exactly. Wow. And and these days it's also. Um, I'm not sure if it's tougher, it's different um, to find a mentor in in anywhere in in audio related. Yeah. When you started, you needed to have hands on and now you also need to have hands on, but it's different differently because of the change in technology. There's more accessible yeah. to everyone. Do you have tips or advice for anyone How, wanted to work yeah. in audio where that's, to start that's that's tough i yeah. i i admit it um the not having good mentors is uh um is difficult um because that's how you learn by yeah. experience and having somebody teach you now um one of the things that does exist is uh, recording schools and recording programs with professionals actually teaching. Yeah. And um, I taught for uh, eight years as an adjunct instructor for SAELA. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my classes that was really important was Studio Protocols and Procedures, which was how to work in the studio with artists and all of that and i could bring my expertise to them and impress upon the students the importance of the social aspect 
that it's a service organization that you're getting into. You're providing a service for someone. Yeah. And for the music. And you have to, those social skills are extremely important, both mm -hmm. in post production as well as creating music. Yeah. I also taught um, production sound, post production audio, and Foley. And um, that was really important because I had a lot of experience in that. And then I also taught music production in the sense of how does a producer work with a band with a budget in the studio, stay on budget and um, on time, mm -hmm. all those things. So those things do exist as long yeah. as the instructors are actual um, engineers and producers, professionals. Yeah. That's about as close to mentoring, I think, as one can get yeah. without having an opportunity to be mentored in a recording mm -hmm. studio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that does exist. And so uh, if one is looking for uh, a situation or to learn or to go to school to learn, mm -hmm. um, find out about the, the faculty and where they've been and what they do. And, yeah. um, and that'll make a big difference. I think so too. I think so too. Wow, well, Lily, this is this has been such an incredible pleasure. I could go on and on and on, but <laughs> <laughs> we could, couldn't we? That was I certainly could. Um, but I'm I think I've I've covered a, a I whole think you've covered stuff. so much, so much, and it's it's all been as interesting. I I yeah, I'm in um, awe. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Well, you know what? Um, I hope you have a fun career too, and and just um seize the moment go to those parties um exactly we all are gonna we're never gonna <laughs> skip no one that has listened to this interview has watched this interview is gonna <laughs> skip one more party <laughs> that's right but make sure you know i've gotten all my best gigs at parties i have oh, wow. to say wow i need to go to more parties <laughs> yeah it, it is that interaction because uh um people get to find out who you are again it's your social skills you know yeah, um exactly yeah. if, if people really like you, they 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 uh, you have to um, oh what's the english word for it in, in dutch we say uh gun factor which means like um um because people like you they're more eager to help mm -hmm. you out or to yeah. guide you in a different direction or to connect you to someone that might be able to help you. Exactly, uh, exactly. And be, a, be um, that asset, don't be a liability, you know, exactly. in the studio or any situation, be that person who's willing to do that job that needs to be done that maybe somebody else doesn't wanna do. Show that you're a team player and exactly. that um, you're, you know, you mean it, that you wanna do it and then, People will know that know that about you, just like yeah. you said, and will you know reach out. I yeah. do all the time. Yeah, yeah. you know, and it's so important. I can. It's so important. Well, thank you again, Lenise. You're for, so for very welcome. Thank watching. you for having me. Uh, well, thank you so much for everyone watching who um, still would like to know more about Lenise. Please go to our website, www.lenisebent.com. And if you'd like to know more about Sound Girls or the Living History Project, because we're interviewing a lot more great, uh, wonderful people, um, please go to www. I'm saying it right yet. Yeah. <laughs> www. Three W's. Three W's. Three W's. <laughs> Soundgirls.org. Um, well, thank you everyone for watching. I hope you had a blast. I did. Um, and thanks again, Lenise. I hope to meet you one day again in Amsterdam yep. or somewhere else. And we're gonna we're gonna have a drink. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Tell more definitely. stories. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Again. Thank, thank you for having me and thank you everybody. I hope you enjoyed this and got something out of it. That means a lot to me. I hope and so. And I too. wish you all the best. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>